Greetings. I'm Father Riel Ouellet. I'm a diocesan priest for the Diocese of Pembroke, where I do ministry. Since 2008, I have been recording on and off homilies, sermons, presentations that I then put on the internet for people to listen to. Most of these recordings are audio recordings. It makes a few years now that I want to sort it all out, to put it together and to arrange it so that it's clear and organized instead of just being on a blog. This video that you're about to watch is one of those recordings. If it is just an audio version, you will see a picture of the church where I made the presentation, or the sermon, or the homily. I hope that these words that I've preached in the past can still reach your hearts and lead you to Jesus. This is what I ask the Holy Spirit to do. Enjoy this video. This morning there are many subjects I could talk about. I could first of all do a homily on the readings, especially as we are the first Sunday of Lent, but I won't do that. I could talk about events that happen in the church, and I will talk about that next week, about the Pope resigning, and also about the year of faith and the plenary indulgence that was granted in our diocese, that, were, that was uh, set up in our diocese according to the plenary indulgence uh, criteria of the Universal Church, and the fact that Fort Coulonge has been chosen to be a place where we can receive the plenary indulgence. But that also I'll talk about probably next week with uh, talking about the Pope. This week what I want to do is to continue our look at the Mass, because two weeks ago we have looked at the introduc introductory uh, rituals, the beginning of the Mass, and now we are going to look at the Liturgy of the Word, the, this part of the Mass which we are presently living. And in all of the aspects of the Mass, all throughout the Mass, I want us to remember something I didn't say. So it's not a remember. I want us to notice something. That during the Mass there's always a dialogue. Either a dialogue between a priest and the crowd, or the assembly, I should say, it's not a crowd, it's an assembly, the official, nice, beautiful word, either between the priest and the assembly, or between God and us. So when I say, the Lord be with you, and you answer, and with your spirit, that is a dialogue between us. In this liturgy of the word that we are living now, there is also that dialogue, but this time it's between the Lord and us. And it takes place in the readings. We have three readings, one usually from the Old Testament, then one from the letters in the New Testament, and then the one of the Gospel. The first one is, as I say, usually always from the Old Testament, from this first part of the Bible. That is very hard to understand, and sometimes we tend to want to leave it aside because it's before Jesus' time. But it is a mistake to do that. Because... As in every situation, if we don't know the background, it is the case in the family history, if we don't know the background, we cannot understand the present. It is the same with Jesus. If we don't know everything that God promised and God said to his people about the promise of the Messiah, we will not understand completely and at its best what Jesus is saying to us and what Jesus is doing in his lifetime here on earth. So that is why we put a lot of emphasis on the Old Testament in the first reading. Most of the time it will be from the Old Testament. During the season of Easter, though, we will then take the first reading from the books of the Acts of the Apostles. The story of the, the Apostles, St. Paul, St. Peter, and all of them, and the beginnings of the Church how the Holy Spirit was acting through them to proclaim the message of the gospel. Occasionally, but rarely, we will take, for the first reading, a reading from the book of Revelation. Because in that book, we see the Church of Heaven. 
we see Jesus in heaven and how it is taking place in heaven. And it is all by images, but it is talking about that. Sometimes the images are hard to understand, but that is what John saw. He saw heaven, he saw it was going there, and he puts it in words that we can understand. So the first reading is always about the life of the church, the life of the people of God, either from the Old Testament, before Jesus, either when just when Jesus left the earth, had the first apostles, or in the forever with Jesus in heaven. So it's always one of those three options that we have for the first reading. So in that reading, God is talking to us. Because God talked to his people. God experienced things with his people in the Old Testament, in the Acts of the Apostles, and in heaven. And so God is talking to us. And after he's done talking, it's our time to reply back, to answer back to God, to say something to him from what he just told us. And this is where the psalm comes in. The psalm is one very particular part of the Bible. There are prayers that, we, that were written to present to God. And so we use the Word of God, because the whole Bible is the Word of God, we use the Word of God to praise God. In Scripture, St. Paul says that it's the Spirit who gets us to praise God, to talk to God. And so that's what we do when we take the psalm. And you'll notice that the psalm is also always having something to do with the first reading. Always has something, is kind of an echo in our life of what first reading is about. After that, we go to the second reading. And most of the time, practically all the time, it is from one of the letters of the apostles. Most of the time it's St. Paul. Other times it will be Peter, James, John, or Jude. Any of those letters that are in the New Testament or the letter to the Hebrews, which we don't know exactly who wrote it. And one of the disciples of St. Paul, we imagine. So we read a letter from St. Paul. Because in those letters, the apostles had to face situations, questions from people or challenges that people were living and that are not so much different than their challenges that we have. Maybe the details are different, the circumstances are a little different, or the way to address them are a little different. But basically, since the beginning of humanity, the heart is ripped off, the heart is challenged, the heart is in difficult situation in the same way throughout humanity. And so all the apostles wrote letters to talk to the first Christians on how to put into action, into practice, the message that they were bringing them. How to live a life of the disciple of Jesus Christ. How to bring that good news into effect in the world. And so this is the second reading from the St. Paul, from St. Peter, from St. Jude, from one of the apostles. And they are talking to us today. Again, God is talking to us through those letters, telling us what we need to do, how we need to look at life, how we need to open our hearts in different situations. Those letters, those readings, the first two readings in the psalm, are done while we're sitting so that we can kind of relax, not stress, and take in, what, take in what God is wanting to tell us. You remember a few weeks ago, it was a reading from a book of the Old Testament. It was about the rededication of the temple. And they were there all day long outside in the bright sunshine, standing and hearing the word of God proclaimed to them. In our church today, since uh, in our not just since Vatican II, but even in the uh, the old rite, we've been sitting for those readings. We've been just taking it in in a very relaxing mode, so that we can absorb more what's going on. Because those readings are there to point to the high point 
of the liturgy of the word, which is the gospel. And the gospel for the liturgy of the word is similar, is a high point just like the consecration for the liturgy of the Eucharist. It is the time and place that we meet Jesus. In the gospel, we read of something about him. We read something that he experienced, something that he lived, something that he taught. And so we make all reverence possible to Jesus in the gospel. In some occasions, or in some setups, if a a church has that book, we will bring the book of the gospel from the altar to the ambo in a venerable procession. You can see that when you go to the cathedral, for example. The deacon will bring the book of the Gospels from the altar to the ambo in a nice procession with the candles and with the incense. That is another thing that we can do. Even if it is just with the lectionary, we can use incense to mark the fact that we are reading the Gospel. And to mark that respect that we have for Jesus while reading the Gospel, what do we do? We stand at that time. Because in standing, we show respect to Jesus. And so we have that reading of the gospel. After which comes the time of usually the homily. The homily is a discourse or a presentation made by the priest to take those readings and to bring them down or to get us to understand them, first of all, if, especially if there's some difficult parts in them, because sometimes there are, to get us to understand what they mean and how they apply in our ordinary life. My hope is that when I do a homily that I do that. Sometimes I'm successful, sometimes not as much, but that is the purpose of the homily, to bring to the assembly that is gathered for the liturgy of the word what those readings are all about, what those readings mean for us, and what we should take now and today from those readings because we can talk about those readings all day long all eternity long because there's so much in the readings but the priest is called to point out what we are what we should be doing by the inspiration of the holy spirit of course for that the position is to be seated so that we can take in and relax in doing so After which, when we have heard all of that from the Lord, when God has spoken to us through the readings, through the homily, because it is supposed to be God speaking through the homily by what the priest says, there's an aspect of exaltation, an aspect that we need to do something about it. Just like in the first part of the Mass, we have been exalting the Lord with the glory to God. You've noticed that we didn't do it in the time of Lent because we are keeping all the festive things for Easter. Just like we praise God with the glory to God, after hearing about God in the liturgy of the Word, we praise Him by professing our faith. At that point, we all stand and we use one of the three forms to declare that we believe in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the Church. And you've noticed that with me, we take the long form. Not because I want to be painful, not because I want to make people suffer, but because in the Nicene Creed, we go into details of what our faith is. Especially when we talk about Jesus and who Jesus is. In the Apostles' Creed, we just say we believe in Jesus Christ. In the Nicene Creed, we go on to say that he's God from God, light from light, true God from true God, and so on. We put more flesh on those bones of our faith. We put more details into what we understand about Jesus. Those creeds, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed, date from long ago. Even the third form that we used a few weeks ago, the baptismal promises, the baptismal creed, when the priest asks a question, do you believe in God the Father Almighty and so on? And the people answer, I do or I believe. Those forms date from the beginning of the church. And they have been transmitted to us. And it is through the, those creeds, whichever form that we use, that we glorify God by proclaiming our faith. After that, of course, 
we open ourselves to prayer. When we believe in God, when we worship Him, we cannot just think about ourselves. Our heart opens for others. And so we present prayers to the Lord. We present intentions. It is called the prayer of the faithful or the universal prayer. Universal prayer because our heart is to open our, is it itself to everyone, not just us. Very often we're tempted just to think about us in that in, uh, universal prayer. But our heart is to be open to everyone. And the church has a kind of set of rules about those intentions of the universal prayer. The first intention should be directed to the church, to any part imaginable of the church, either the shepherds of the church, the pope, the bishops, the priests, either the people of the church, catechists, the whatever that is related with the church. The first prayer should be related to the church. The second prayer, we're called to pray for civil authorities. Sometimes we like civil authorities, sometimes we have problems with them. And especially in times we have problems with them, we should present them to the Lord. We should open our hearts to present them to the Lord. To ask the Lord to inspire them, to get them to be faithful civil servants. And so we present our society in presenting our civil servants. And so the second intention is for our society, for the civil servants of our society, for our governments, and so on. The third intention is for people who suffer, either the sick, the poor, those who are experiencing the tragedy of famine, or whatever suffering there is in the world. The third intention is to open our hearts to those suffering and to present them to the Lord. And the final prayer, the fourth one, is for our assembly, for our community. And all sometimes when we hear those prayers, whichever one it is, we might not think that it is relating to us in particular that day. But it is relating to someone who needs that prayer. There are different sets, different prayers in the wording, in the what we ask with the old missiles that we had last year and the years before the living with Christ, Novalis was suggesting some prayers. The new missiles, the St. Joseph's one, don't have any of those in the missiles, so that is why I have made a little booklet with different intentions that are related to those different uh, categories. And so this is the liturgy of the Word, by which God is speaking to us in a very particular way. The dialogue that we have with God through the liturgy of the Word, where God feeds us from His Word as He will feed us from His body and blood in the Eucharist. And so I invite us this week to look and to meditate, to realize how the liturgy of the Word works and to open our heart to live the liturgy of the Word with deeper understanding, with deeper uh, realization that God is really speaking to us in the literature of the Word and at different times as in all dialogues we are called to answer back to him to talk back to him to engage in this dialogue with him through the liturgy of the Word.